Welcome to Code It Like It's Hot. My name is Pam Cabe and I will be giving this presentation today. So first a few things about me. I am a media coordinator and I work at Fairview School, which is part of Jackson County Public Schools located in beautiful Silva, North Carolina. I am a mom to two kids, um, Jackson, who is 22, and Alina, who is 19. Um, I am a wife and I'm a dog mom to Willow, who is a German Shepherd. We're going to begin today by talking about block coding um, because this is the foundation of coding and it's going to be the foundation of the platforms that we're going to examine today in this instruction. Um, just what is block coding? A block code is used to convert software code or an algorithm into any particular form so that errors, if any in the code, can be minimized. For student purposes, block coding is going to allow your students to access very powerful coding language in a very visual and easy to use format. Otherwise, students would have to learn how to code and how to use JavaScript and HTML, Python, or other coding languages, which are just complicated for them to use. So block coding allows them to access some of these same features, but allows them to do it in a way that is visual and easy to use. When I talk to students about block coding, um, I show them some examples, and this is an example which you will see um, again when we start talking about the platform Scratch. But um, a block code just runs top to bottom, and then whatever you place inside of that code is going to run. So in this particular example, um, our event that starts our whole co code off when flag clicked is the top thing that we have. And in most coding platforms, you will find that there is some kind of initial piece of coding block that gets everything going. And you'll see that in our examples today. Um, and then in this particular example um, from scratch, we want um, our character to glide, which is a, a great way for them to move. And we're having them move to a particular place on our screen and a lot of this is laid out on an XY coordinate plane which students are familiar with from their math class and this is where those numbers come from. One of the first things that I like to do to get students going with block coding is to um, have them play a game in groups instead of using a device and actually have them use um, paper laminated block code to code their characters. So this is a game kind of based on that pitfall game that we all played in the 80s called Jungle Jam Coding Edition. If you click on the picture, it will take you to the original file, which you are welcome to make copies of. Um, it has an easier version of the game, which we're going to look at today, and then a more complicated version of the game that might be better for older students. And again, you're welcome to click on that and make a copy of that. This is going to be the simpler version of this game, and it's really simple. Um, you can put students into groups and give them a bunch of block codes and then have them navigate to whatever they happen to spin with the spinner. And this is a spinner from Will of Names, and I'll show you what that looks like. So this is actually the spinner. We would tap spin. So whatever they happen to spin, they're trying to navigate to the fire. So we can go back to the game board and the fire is located here. So the group that has that particular spin would then have to lay out the code to get them to that location. So they would probably start with that when flag clicked block and then have some move blocks to move their character there. And then the next group would spin and so on and so forth as you navigate through the game board just to have them practice in groups with the block coding. So back up two slides to this slide. And again, if you click here in the center, this is gonna open up a larger file 
and you are welcome to make a copy of this file and change it and use it as your own, but you'll see the Jungle Jam game that I included in the slide deck, but then there's also a more advanced game that would be great for your older students, and the main difference here, you've got some characters that you can move around the board. Um, you still have the spinner that is located here, but when you land on the different objects that are on the game board, you have some messages. So, for example, if you land on the banana, your character is hungry. The banana is a welcome surprise. If you don't pick up the banana, you will have to return to start. So what I tell students is sometimes they want to move through a square and sometimes they want to jump over a square, and they have to kind of make that decision. So if they use the jump code, which is included in their block codes, then they would jump over this and not be able to get the banana and have to go back to start. So it just makes this game a little more complicated for those students and a little more advanced. To make a copy of this file, once you open it, you would go to File, Make a Copy, Entire Presentation, and that would allow you to make a copy of this whole file and again edit and use it as you would choose to do. So now we are going to be looking at our first coding platform, which is going to be Scratch. Um, Scratch is a free programming language and online community where you can create your own interactive stories, games, and animations. Um, it was created by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it is free and allows students to access coding in an easy-to-use environment. So I'm going to go out to this page. Um, and the first thing that you're going to want to do is create your free account. And the next couple of slides in our slide deck are going to walk you through doing that. It is a very easy process. Um, it is just a wizard. You just answer the questions and click forward through that. So I'll go back to the slide deck just to show you those instructions are here. Join Scratch, click Next, click your country, birth date, gender, create your account. And then once we have created an account, we'll be ready to start working in a project. So to sign in, we click the sign in button and enter our login information. And this is going to take us to our main Scratch page. Um, to create a project, we're going to click on Create. And this is going to make a blank project board. So let's begin by talking about what we see on the screen. Up here at the top is the name of your project. And that's probably one of the first things that you're going to want to change. I always instruct students to name this something that they will remember. That way, once they have several projects created, they're not trying to figure out what each of these is. So I'm just going to call this test project. Okay. Over on the left-hand side of the screen, we have the different code that is available to us. We have motion. There's that glide code that we used earlier in our instruction. Looks, and this is where we can get characters to actually say things or to switch costumes, which will make more sense in just a minute. We can also switch backdrops. Sound, events. And these are the things that get our presentation started. So you can see that there's the when flag clicked, and that's the one that most of my students use because that's the one I demonstrate to them. But they can also use any of these other things that are here as well. So if they have a sprite, which is their character, they want it to start when that is clicked, they can um, set it to work that way also. And you can see all the other blocks that are here, and you can even create your own blocks. So let's look a little bit about how to actually begin our coding project. As I said, you get a default sprite, which is this cat, and it's located down here. So if students want to code this cat, they can. And we'll start out by doing that. So I want to load an event code. Again, that's the thing that gets everything going. We'll just use the when flag clicked. And I want to set it so that this cat will move from one location on the screen to another location on the screen. So if I know I want the cat to start here and move to this location, that's what I'm going to have it do. So this is the starting point, but I want it to end up here. If you move it to the end point, it will change the coordinates in the code to match that ending point. So now if I click and drag this up here, move the cat back to where it starts from and click the flag, it will glide to the end point that I have chosen. So that's the first thing that we want to make this cat do. 
The other thing I mentioned a second ago were costumes, and costumes are just different looks, and the characters inside of Scratch, some of them have multiple looks. So right now, this is costume two, this is costume one, so you can see there's a slight difference. And the costumes allow you to create the illusion of animation inside of the project. So if I want this cat to start in costume one, and then change after we've glided to the end point. I can go to looks, switch to costume two, and then play. And you can see it kind of gives the illusion that the cat is running. The other thing that we can do is add a backdrop. And if you just wave over this icon down here with your mouse, you'll see Choose a backdrop is going to let you search what's inside of Scratch. And most of the time, I think this is probably the most successful for students. So I'm just going to pick this boardwalk. And I'm going to let my cat move along the boardwalk. And I've got to go back to set my costume back to the first one. That is something that is a little annoying about Scratch, but you do have to go back and reset your characters and location and then the way that they look. So then we'll run the code. And you can see that we very quickly created just a small little animated project with movement. You can have more than one sprite. So if I want to add a sprite, I'll wave over this button and go to search. And again, I'm going to choose something that's just a part of Scratch because a lot of times they have a lot more capability with costumes and movement. So we'll pick the beetle. And if I go to costumes, it's going to show me if there's anything else available. And for this particular sprite, there is not anything else available. And that's fine. So if we want to make the beetle do things, you'll notice that my code is now gone. If I click back on sprite one, that code's attached to that character. Each time you add a character, you have to add new code for that particular character. So if we have both characters over here and maybe I want to have this character end up here so I'm gonna bring a beginning code here I'm gonna go back to motion to get that glide code and remember I'm gonna put it at the end point so that the coordinates fill themselves in and move that up and then I need to reset the costume for that one and then both of these things are going to happen at the same time so they're going to go at exactly the same speed now if I wanted for my bug to be slower there's code to accomplish that too if I click on the beetle there is a vent code control code called wait so I'm going to pull this down and I'm going to have it wait just a few seconds before it starts. So let's say two seconds. Let's move everybody back. And let's reset the costume for my cat. you can see it waited and one thing I really try to emphasize to students is although I only set that wait period for two seconds two seconds is a long time in computer time so if that was too long for it to wait I may want to change that and play around with that so those are just a few things that you can do um, let's look at sound really quickly if you click on sounds and you wave over the sound button you can search for sounds that are a part of the system and a lot of students get real caught up in this there's a lot of music these are just a few examples when you wave over the play button it will play um, a lot of the students like the dance music because it sounds like music And then once you have clicked on music, it will appear on the sound screen and you can edit it and use it inside of your presentation. What the other thing that students really like is they're able to record 
So record is also here. We wave over the sound button and go to the microphone. And it's probably going to ask you if it can have permission to your microphone. That's fine. And you can tell that I'm speaking and that this is moving, that it's picking up my voice. If you were to click on that and you did not see any movement over here on the left-hand side, then it would not be picking up your voice. And I'm connected, but I'm not sure if it'll let me record or not because I'm recording this. Let's see. This is a bug and this is a cat. Let's see if we can hear that. This is a bug and this is a cat. Okay, and I'm going to save that. And I can leave it recording one, but one thing that happens is that students for, record multiple times and forget. So again, naming, I really try to emphasize that that is super important for them to do. So now I have my bug cat sound here. I also have this dance sound there if I wanted to use that. But I'm going to come back to code. Because I have selected the bug, that is where that sound lives. I have a lot of times students will click back on their another sprite and be like, I can't find my sound. My sound's not there. That's because whatever sprite you are connected to, that is where that sound is created and attached as well. So let's see, let's move our characters back. And remember we have to change his costume. But we're gonna go back to the bug because that's where our sound lives. We're going to come over here to the sound and we're going to put that after the two characters glide. And so remember our wait time was a little bit too much. So we're just going to go a second and let's see what happens. This is a bug and this is a cat. So that's just a very quick introduction to using Scratch and a basic beginning project. One thing that I do with students is I like to give them some parameters for a project. I usually let them play on day one just like we just did. I let them go in with a blank project and add whatever they want to and add whatever sounds that they want to and just kind of get a feel for how the program works. And that exploration time is really important. Sometimes teachers don't want to lose time on those activities, but it's really important for students to have time to explore on their own and to figure out how to use all the different functions. And it never fails in a group of students like, hey, I figured out how to do this or hey, I know how to do that. And so when students have questions, a lot of times I like to direct those questions to the class. So I may say, hey, anybody figure out how to record your voice and have students explain to other students how to do that. Um, first of all, it gives them a lot of ownership over what they're doing and some student empowerment and involvement, um, but it also shows them the power of just exploring and learning to use the program. So usually what we did today would be day one of this project. On day two, I like to give them some parameters and give them some instructions. So for this particular project, I have asked them to go out to a tongue twister site. So let me move forward here. We've covered a lot of this information. Um, this is the tongue twister site and it's linked here. And I have them just choose any tongue twister that's available on this site. Um, there are a bunch of just one sentence tongue twisters that are there, which make it really easy. Seashells, seashells by the seashore, really simple. And then I create a project as an example and I show it to them. So there is my tongue twister example. I'm going to open that. See inside. And I'm going to reset my character. to the way I want her to start. You can see in this particular example, I have three sprites. So if I go here, this is moving also. My crab is not moving, but is where my music is played. And the reason the crab doesn't move is because you would have to put movement before the sound. And I wanted the sound to play at the same time that all this other action was taking place. So now that I have everybody moved back, I'm going to make this full screen by clicking on this icon and clicking the flag. She sells seashells by the seashore. So this is just an example that I show to students and then they start working using that tongue twister page to create their own tongue twister scratch project. So this would be an appropriate time for you to pause this video 
and to click on that site and give this sort of creation a try. And then you can join us in just a few minutes and we will move on to the next coding platform. One thing I do as a culminating activity with Scratch is that I allow students to share what they have created with the class. And we do this in a couple of different ways. Um, students hate to do presentations and I'm sensitive to this because I remember being really afraid to do that myself when I was their age. So we have a couple of different options. The first option that we use is a gallery walk. To accomplish the gallery walk, I have students open up their project on their device and then I split the class in half and half one walks over and walks around group two's projects, allows them to play the project for them, ask questions about the project and just in general lets them present, but presenting to individuals rather than the whole class in front of the whole class. And then we switch groups. Group one would come, open their projects up, group two would come over and walk around and look at those individual projects until they have seen everything. I always have a handful of kids who don't want to connect to the board and show the whole class their project at one time. And so I allow students to do that voluntarily. Um, and this kind of hits everybody with their comfort level when it comes to presentations. So with that, we come to our next block coding platform, and that is Microsoft Make Code. The Microsoft Make Code is created by Microsoft. It's free and it's an open source platform, and it's going to allow students to take the block coding skills that they have learned in Scratch and to kick those up a notch. Um, my older students really enjoy using this program because it's going to allow them to make a game. And so we do some of the same parameters, but it just allows them to do so much more. So let's take a look at what this looks like. When you click on that link, it's going to open up the Microsoft Make Code Arcade main page. And you'll notice in the upper right hand corner, there is a sign in button. And you are going to have to sign in with a Microsoft account or you're going to have to create a Microsoft account. And there's some instructions here in the slide deck to do that. Um, if you have an account already, you can click on sign in and just fill in that information. And we happen to have Microsoft in our district as well as Google. And so that is a real simple process for me. But if you don't have an account, you will click create one and it's going to walk you through creating a free Microsoft account so that you also have access to this platform. For the purposes of our instruction today, you can work without being signed in and you can see that I did that a little bit and it did save the work that I did here on this particular computer. The advantage of signing in is that you can work from any device and access your actual Microsoft account in order to do that. So you have some choices that you can make there. So I'm going to sign in, sign in. And it's going to take me into choosing the account. And I'm just going to stay signed in. And it's going to take me in. And so at the top, we have my projects. And these are things that I have already created. But to get started, what I typically do on day one is I have students scroll down and find the block game section of Microsoft to make code arcade. And the reason for that is it's important for students to see where they're going. What is the end point of what I'm trying to do? So I have them play three or four games. And what you'll notice when it opens this example is it's going to show students all the code involved in making what is a very simple old school video game. So I'm going to make this larger so you can see it. It tells me move with the left and right buttons and then we'll get started. Jump up with A or the A button and then just double jump. So you can see this just looks like a lot like old school Mario.
And so you just let students kind of play and see how this goes. This one actually is a lot like the very first Mario game. I'm telling my age here by showing you that. But that's just an example of the way that I would probably introduce this activity to students and did introduce this activity this year. So you would scroll down and let them play a couple of games. Once they have played some games, there's a couple of different ways to go at learning to use this platform. This is a little more advanced than Scratch, so it's very difficult to start from a blank project. Um, so one thing I really try to emphasize with students is that they either work through a tutorial to create a game because they're going to create their own original game or that they work through a skill map. Um, the skill map takes a little bit longer, but it does teach them a lot of really good, valuable skills. This beginning skill map works them through several different games, and then these skill maps work them through these specific types of games and activities. So you've got a monster truck game, shark attack, save the forest. Um, you can see there's a lot of different ones that are here, and so they can choose one of those to kind of get a start with if they choose to do that. So we will look at just using a tutorial. Usually the easiest game that's on here and the easiest tutorial to complete is Chase the Pizza. And so if I know students are going to struggle with this activity, I will try to guide them towards starting with this one. So when you click on a tutorial, it gives you some choices. Um, I do not have any students who work in JavaScript and Python, but if you did have students who were able to code in those languages, this is a really good opportunity for them to practice doing that. But I'm going to start with a blocks tutorial. And I don't think I had any students who coded in Python or JavaScript. So this is what the game does. The smiley face is just touching the pizza. We have score and then we have a timer. So it's pretty basic. And then Microsoft Make Code gives you exact instructions on how to go in and to create all of these things. So it says over here we have these are toolboxes. Our characters inside of Microsoft Microsoft Make Code are also called sprites, just like Scratch. So the first instruction says open the scene toolbar, which is right here, and drag set background color into the on start block. And so inside of the tutorials, it only gives you the code that you were going to need inside this specific game and activity. So it kind of makes that a little bit simpler. And then we go to next and it tells us the next thing to do. We're going to set our background color. Okay, and we can do whatever color we want to do. You don't have to do the color that is there. Then we'll do next. And you can see as I code, this is what my game looks like. Or I can click here on this little console to show myself the game. And this takes me back to the code. Open the Sprites toolbox drawer and drag the first block, set my sprite. So I'll go here, set my sprite as this very first block. I'm going to put it here. This is going to create a player in my game. Draw your player by clicking on the gray square. So when we click on the gray square, it's going to open up the editor and I can create whatever kind of character that I want to create here to use. Stu some students really enjoy this particular part of the activity and some of them do not. And it just varies on the kid. If they don't want to draw their own character, they can come up here to the gallery up at the top and choose a character that is already a part of Microsoft Make Code. So they can choose any of the characters that are here. So for time's sake, I'm going to do that. But just know I can go in and create anything here. And I can edit this character once I have it pulled onto the screen. So once I have completed that and have an image, I'm going to click Done. And then there it is. And we're going to go Next. Open the Controller Toolbox Door and move, move my sprite with buttons. There it is. After my sprite, right there. And this is going to allow the player to move around with the arrow keys. And the game simulator that it discusses here is what I told you was here, this console. So if I come here, 
and I use the arrow keys or if I use the buttons on screen right here by maximizing it I can move that so I'm gonna go back to code and you can see how many instructions that we have left this is 7 of 19 so we're almost halfway open the sprites toolbox drawer and drag another set my sprite to so we'll go here And this is going to be the pizza in our game, Chase the Pizza. So when I go to next, and it says, in set my sprite block, click on my sprite 2, and rename variable. We're going to call this pizza, and then click OK because that's what it's told us to do, and then we click Next. In the Set Pizza block, click on Player to open the menu of the different types of sprites, and we're going to select Food. Here's Food. Okay, and that was an extra piece of code. It must have come out from somewhere when I was selecting that. Okay, so that's what I want that to be. Click Next. And now we have to find the picture of the pizza. So if we click on this, it's going to open up that gallery. And students, again, can draw this if they want to. But if you go to Gallery, we know there's pizza here. I'll click Done. There's the pizza. Open the Sprites toolbox. On Sprite overlaps with other Sprite is a loop that's there. There it is. And we can put this anywhere. It will not go inside our green start block. In this on Sprite overlaps other Sprite block, which is this blue block we just pulled, click on the second player kind after other Sprite to open the menu and select food as its type. So I'm having a hard time seeing this. So let me move this up just a little. Okay, so remember that's going to be food. Okay. When our player when our player overlaps with the pizza sprite, let's add a point to our game score. In the info toolbox, which is right here, drag a change score into this block. So anything that goes inside of this block has specifically to do with this function of the game. Let's set a position for the pizza to random locations around the screen. So we're going to open the sprites toolbox drawer and drag a set my sprite position into this block. In the Set My Sprite Position block, click on My Sprite Variable to open the menu and select your pizza sprite. So here is this, there is pizza, and now we're going to set the coordinates next. We're going to go to Math, pick Random, and we're going to drag this into the X box. Did you see where this box is and you see how that makes a connection when I drag it over there? going to pull that in and we're going to grab another block just like that and put it in the Y. So again we pull it over here make sure it connects to the Y box. Now we have two of those boxes. In the first random block, we're going to change the maximum value from 10 to 160. And we can just click in there and type. And in the second, the maximum value becomes 120. OK. 
Okay, and one thing I also tell students, you'll notice here a bar appears and we have to scroll down. Sometimes students miss that they have to scroll down. And so if their game at any point is not performing like they expect it to perform, I always instruct them to back up and make sure they've scrolled down and looked at all of the instructions. All right, let's restart our countdown each time from the info toolbox, which is here. Drag a start countdown into the OnSprout Overlaps block. So there's a countdown. And move my block over so I can get it in there. And we can set that to whatever we want. Last instruction. Now if we go to the game simulator and make this big, this should work just like the example game. So every time I touch it, it's getting points. And I'm moving this on my screen so it's a little awkward. So you can see where the points are, where the time timer is. And every time you touch it, it restarts the timer. They can also play this with the arrow keys on the keyboard, and that's probably a little bit easier than them trying to use the screen. So that's just a little example of how to do one of the tutorials. And one thing that I tell students, once they have finished doing this tutorial, if they do not close down this tutorial, like we don't click done, I always tell them not to click done, we can go back into this screen and we can adjust any of these parameters for their individual projects. So they can change the background color, they can change the sprite, they can change the food if they want to make this a different thing and that allows students who maybe are not able to start from a blank project access to being able to create a project a little bit faster by using a pre-created tutorial but then making it their own by drawing and changing the characters and the food and creating a custom background. If I click back on Microsoft make code arcade up here at the top it takes me back to this main screen this is the one that i just created um, some of my students do like to go into a new project and start from scratch and that's okay too if they wanted to start from scratch but they wanted to do a game kind of like this i would probably have them open this game up there's all of their code there's that duplicated code again let me get rid of that um, there's all of their code and we know that this game works and then they can in a second screen open Microsoft make code arcade up again and open a new blank project and it gives them access to some help because we know their other project is right here, they can come over here and look and say, okay, the first thing that I needed to do if I back up in my instructions is to create, is to create this background color and pull this in. So now if I go to my blank project, the first thing I'm gonna do is that scene. And you'll see I have a lot more options here. So maybe instead of a color, I want to do an image so I'm going to try that I'm going to pull that in and that's the first thing I'm going to do and if I click on the gray square we know that takes us to the editor I can draw a scene here if I want to or if I go to the gallery I can find other scenes that exist and I've had a lot of students do this I'm going to pick this castle because I do have kids that have used this so that's my background and again I can see what's happening over here you'll notice that gone is my ability to flop between my instructions and my console because I'm in a brand new project that's blank but I have my second window open up here at the top so I can go back and kind of see okay I did that now I need a character so I can come up here to sprites and set my sprite. I know that I need that. So if I come back to my blank project and go to sprites, there's my character. 
again, that gray box is going to let me draw a character or choose one from the gallery. And either of those is fine. You're going to find some students really get into the drawing and they really like that creative aspect of this game. Um, and then other students aren't so into the drawing necessarily, but they're really interested in creating levels and content and that kind of thing. So one thing that I say to students about creating a blank project and working, even if they have another window open and they're flopping back and forth between instructions and working, is that they are at a point in their life when they reach middle school, and I do this activity with seventh and eighth grade students, where their effort is going to directly result in what they gain in terms of knowledge. My class is not a graded class. I teach a STEM class that's an enrichment class, so we don't do grades. Um, I expect students to do the work, but if students come in and they don't put a lot of effort in, then they're probably not going to get a lot of knowledge back. And most of my students are real motivated by this particular platform, and they really want to learn how to do this, this kind of work um, potentially in the future. And so they're real motivated. So a lot of students will really push themselves to start from a blank project and really try to build all of their own content from the ground up. Um, so just like in Scratch, day one is usually spent, back out at this for a second, exploring the block games that are here and having them look at the code and kind of see, okay, so for this game, this is the code that it takes to make all of this happen. This particular game happens to have levels, and so a lot of my students who want to make something with levels, they come in here and they kind of investigate all the code that's here, and you can see there's a lot of code here to make this game, and that's something I don't think sometimes students understand, and this is, you know, a 16-bit game, old-school Mario-looking game, um, so to think about the kind of code that it takes to make the games that they probably play now on a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox um, is, is incredible because this is a lot of code just to make what is available here. But we spend that first day just looking at those block games and looking at the code that it takes to make those things. Um, the next day I have them come in and I have them choose either a skill map or a tutorial to complete. Um, you can see it didn't take us very long to do Chase the Pizza, and there's a bunch of tutorials available here as they scroll on across. This one's kind of like old school Galaga. Um, a lot of my boys like this basketball game, and they'll change the characters. Um, I had a kid that did one with a cheeseburger and pizza, and it was very funny. Um, but they can come in here and kind of pick one of these that they want to work on. And then on day three, if they have not finished a tutorial, I like for them to complete at least one tutorial or to complete a skill map. Um, I want them to start their project and we talk about how to use two screens so that you've got some instructions from your tutorial um, if they want to do that. Um, or I talk to them about just creating a blank project by coming up here and clicking on new project. Um, and just starting from scratch and all the code that they have available just by being able to do that. So that's typically the, the function of the way that it works. Um, I usually give them about a week to work on their project. Um, I don't like to assign homework in this class because it's not for a grade, but I can tell you the kids who made the better games were kids who worked on it a little bit at home, and they were motivated to do that, and um, they did that. But we spend about a week on this project, so we usually start Monday with exploration, Tuesday with tutorial or skill map, and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, usually Monday, Tuesday of the next week, and about Wednesday we present. And presentations work a lot. Like with Scratch, students would pull their game up, whatever that game happened to be. They would open it, and they would open it up on the screen just like this, and they would play each other's games and then talk to them about how to do that and ask questions, and if they like to feature, oh, how did you do that? How did you add that thing? And it's very, very simple to present that. Just like with the other activity, I always have a couple of kids who want to have their game up on the big screen and have kids all see their game, and so I let them do that again voluntarily um, if they choose to do that. 
Um, this is an appropriate time for you to pause this video and to play around inside Microsoft Make Code, and then let me know if you have any questions. Welcome back. As I said, if you have any questions about Scratch or Microsoft Make Code that I can help you with, here is my contact information. I am happy to connect with you and help you in any way that I possibly can. Um, thank you for joining me today for Code It Like It's Hot. Join me for part two of this instruction where we connect what we have learned about coding into the area of robotics.